disagreement in marriage is essential, actually. Two people with different personalities look at the world in different ways. So before I got married, I decided to do some counseling sessions and I was sweating going into it. You know, a lot of people say everyone should do therapy, but I was really uncomfortable with the whole idea. Well, jokes on me. I thought it would be a great idea if I invited the psychologist who I was having these counseling sessions with. Dr. Chris Hart is a renowned psychologist and what we call a relationship guru. He has a very popular relationship column in the Kenyan newspapers. He's also been featured on numerous TV shows. And today he's going to give us some advice on a very important topic. What breaks a marriage and can it really be fixed? So much to talk about. So let's get right into it. I couldn't think of anyone better to have this conversation with today because it's, it is heavy. It's difficult. There's a lot to unpack. We all go into marriage with the best of intentions, with so much love in our hearts. We want to grow old together. And then it just somehow goes horribly wrong. So are we making promises that we cannot keep or is the institution of marriage a failed one? Oh, I certainly don't think it's a failed one. I mean, through all of history and through all the world today, couples couple up. They call it all sorts of different things and the rules vary around the world. But, you know, there is an abiding wish for men and women to get together and they mean it. But there are lots of reasons why marriage is hard. The worst one, which is very modern, is that our expectations are all wrong. Hmm. You know, people had much lower expectations of marriage if you go back hundreds of years. I mean, life was all about staying alive. And so you got married because, frankly, there was no other way to survive. Your expectations were, OK, I've got a roof over my head and somehow we'll cope. Now we go in expecting the world, hmm. expect love and passion and <laughs> we expect our partner to complete us. And we lack the skills to make that happen because that's not part of the toolkit of a normal human being. That's the problem. You know, you, you watch Hollywood movies and you, you come to the age of marriage with very high expectations, but the skill set doesn't develop. One thing we forget is our relationships are based on what we saw growing up, how our parents interacted. How big a role does that play in our adult relationships? And is that something that we can maneuver and change about ourselves? First of all, you're 100% right. It's highly influential, but we tend not to think about it. Most people sweep their, chi their, their childhood under the carpet. You know, they forget the details. There's a certain degree of amnesia involved. For example, my mother recently went into a nursing home, and so we've been dealing with a lot of her possessions. And in amongst all that, we came across endless letters and stuff and photographs that she had accumulated during our childhoods. And I was absolutely staggered at some of the things I had totally forgotten. The problem with all of this is that we become adults. And, and we forget that we are still that person who was five, six, seven, eight years old. And it's awfully easy to say, OK, I didn't have any trauma. Nobody abused me. So I'm all right. But you don't realize that a lot of your expectations about how life's going to be were set down during that period. And your perfectly nice parents, without you realizing it, set you on a path that you, you struggle to escape from. You know, if you grew up in, say, the 70s, and now you're trying to repeat the whole exercise, life's changed. So your problems and all the other things are different. And yet you're using a toolkit from 1970. What people need to do is to be aware of how much they're running a program from their childhood and to question it and discuss it together. If you notice that your spouse is reacting negatively to something, one of your first questions is, why? Why do you hold this view that I disagree with? And usually you'll discover with a bit of skillful probing that this is a layer of your personality that you can access. And it arose during your teens and before. And once you start questioning it, of course, you can change it. But if you aren't aware it's there, you just say, well, that's the way it is. I'm right and you're wrong. I had a conversation and that person said, I've been married for five years, but I've been unhappy for three out of those five. Is that normal? Do a lot of couples feel unhappy for very many years? I'm afraid so, yes. Um, and that's really, dare I say it, that's their own fault. Because if you do wake up one morning and realize you're unhappy in a relationship, you really ought to start to talk about that. You know, you should, in the nicest possible way, you should go to your partner and say, hey, 
things are not quite going as I expected. Can we just sit down and figure this all out? Partly, I sympathize with them. It's because these feelings creep up on you. You don't suddenly wake up, say you're unhappy. You, you just wake up one morning and realize, actually, I'm sliding down some slope. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and you tend to sort of shrug your shoulders a bit and say, it'll be better tomorrow. People say all married couples bicker. Is bickering a normal part of being married or is it dangerous? Let's just say, first of all, that disagreement in marriage is essential, actually. You sometimes meet couples who say, oh, we never argue. That means normally that one is a doormat um, or the other one's controlling or something like that. It will be a one-sided element to a situation. Okay, so it's healthy to, to disagree. It's very healthy to disagree. Normally, couples choose each other for the, for differing personality types. It's very unusual to marry somebody who has the same personality type as themselves. What your personality type tells you is how you look at the world. Two people with different personalities look at the world in different ways. And so they will see an identical situation and interpret it differently. And I think that's very healthy. So couples should constantly, whenever there's, there's, say, a a choice or a decision to make, they should say, okay, I see it like this. spouse says well I don't Mm. and then they should explore why they see it differently and out of that exploration comes the best possible choice now that's the definition of a good way to deal with disputes but Mm. as you rightly say a lot of people just end up bickering John Mm. Gottman's a very famous psychologist who analyzes the destruction of marriages how couples fall apart and he identifies some communication habits that develop when things get a little strained and people start to criticize and they start to express unpleasant ideas they're contemptuous yeah i was just going to mention criticism because i think that's a big mm. one, a major one. I, I also have to remind myself that behind every criticism is a wish. A wish. My partner mm. wants me to do something. The brain is wired to pay more attention to downsides than upsides. So we have a tendency to take a sentence apart and see the negatives in it more than the positives. That will be the default. You'll mm. feel that what your partner said was hurtful. And, it, and of course, you'll step back. What about confirmation bias, which is something I've been reading about? For example, if you feel your partner doesn't care about you enough and did something that shows you that he doesn't care. I think the danger is disregarding evidence that proves otherwise down the line. We were constantly looking mm. for that proof that, yeah, I, I knew it. You don't care about me. I told you. Why do we tend to get stuck in, in, in ah, that? Well, I mean, you're, you're dead right. I mean, confirmation of bias is, is one of the heuristics of the way our brains work. You know, and we do do it all the time. You know, you think what happens when you buy a car, you instantly stop reading the adverts. You don't want to realize that you made a bad decision. So you only read the things that say good things about your car. The generic term for all of these things is irrational thinking, isn't it? There's a whole set of thought processes that we indulge in, like confirmation bias, that are not helpful. And the more you become aware of them in yourself and pick on the ones that aren't doing your marriage any favors, the better. Yeah. We, as partners, expect our partner to change. If he would only change, everything would be fine. But yet, it's very difficult for us to change ourselves. I, don't, I think sometimes we lose sight of that, how difficult change is. Change is a funny thing. If you imagine living with the same phone for the next 50 years, you obviously wouldn't like that idea, would you? So <laughs> certain sorts of change we like. We like new things. But we are also creatures of habit. Um, we get into routines, and, we, and the routines involve the way we think about things. Do people actually change? Yeah, they do. There's no question. Life thrusts the demand for change on us, doesn't it? You know, deaths in the family, illnesses, redundancy. Most changes that occur in our lives are actually all negative. Somehow, our expectations of marriage, though, are that that's not going to happen. And so it becomes tough for us to confront the fact that we have a problem in our marriage. The mythology is that if I get married, I'll be happy. And so when you discover you're not happy, you think, well, I chose the wrong partner, didn't I? Uh, That's hard to deal with, isn't it? What's really happening is that, yes, you're changing. You were happy-go-lucky students or something. And then all of a sudden, you're now five years older with children and responsibilities and a mortgage. Of course, you've got to change. And hopefully, 
the couple stays on the same page. Mm -hmm. There's another thing it's worth just mentioning. To a large extent, the process of courtship is like an autopilot. You know, we're instinctively wired to court one another. So there's all sorts of crazy things we do as young couples, which cause us to fall in love. And I hate to say this, all those things run out and you have to replace it with parenting skills and long-term attachments. And people don't realize that that's necessary. Mm -hmm. So when all the infatuation hormones start to decline around about year two of a marriage, Oh, gosh, everybody starts saying I, I started to become unhappy in the second year of my marriage. Right. You ran out of hormones mm -hmm. and you didn't realize that you've actually got to replace them with something more substantial. Do you feel that men and women fight differently in any way? Oh, utterly. You, you, you're absolutely right. The male and female conflict style is vigorously different. Again, people don't know that. They're not skilled up to recognize that. It's a problem in the workplace, let alone in marriages. But it's especially a problem in marriages because you're supposed to be so nice to one another. You know, you can fall out with people at work and not feel too bad about it. But if somebody falls out with their spouse, the subtext is they don't love me anymore. So, yeah, I mean, one of the things that couples have got to do is learn the different styles. Better than that, they've got to turn them to their advantage. If a problem is arising, a female expects to talk it out. They want to verbalize the issue. A male, on the other hand, wants to think about it. So he will want to go off into a corner and then he'll come with, back with solutions. Now, his wife finds that very annoying because she wants to explore out loud and, and perceives solutions and advice as shutting her down. So you can see you're instantly, things are not going to go well. The way out of that is to avoid ambushing one another. In other words, if she says to him, look, I think we ought to talk about so-and-so, when would be a good time? He'll do a bit of thinking. And if he's wise, when they start to talk, he will listen rather than give advice. And so she will get her chance to explore. And he'll listen to what she's saying and incorporate it into his thinking. And half an hour later, they're problem solving. How do you make a marriage work when your partner doesn't want to have these Uh, difficult conversations? The starting point is to think about why that's happening. Because if you go back to the beginning of courtship, most couples talk 19 to the dozen, don't they? <laughs> But then something creeps in. People start giving one another a hard time. The criticism starts to develop. And if I go to my wife and start talking about something, she'll probably, you know, be a bit short-tempered and all the rest of it. Before you know it, people stop this endless banter. Things are not talked about and people just live for a quiet life. So the starting point is you have to examine the way a couple is communicating and try and get back to that place where you can talk about anything. There's one expectation everybody should have and they should make sure it, it really happens. And that is that they are completely open and honest with one another. Thank you for watching and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on the next discussion on how you can actually fix a broken marriage.